We've got a real explosive one today because we are bringing you the top super weapons of the Warcraft setting. And I'm not just talking about a sword that hits really hard, not even the Warglaives of Azanoth, even though they're so iconic. No, we're only including things that will level a city at a minimum. True super weapons. So you better keep him safe with today's sponsor, NordVPN.com forward slash Bellular Gaming with the code Bellular Gaming, which will get you a two year plan with a huge discount plus four months free. Why get a VPN? That's simple. Do you want to watch content from another region, right? You know, Netflix, Amazon, etc. Well, easy. Use Nord's 5,000 plus servers to choose your location and browse the internet as if you were in that location. They also keep you private so your ISP won't know what sites you're using. That means they can't sell your browsing data to advertisers, can't snoop about, and they can't prioritize some of the types of traffic that you use over others. They also have got Nord Locker for storage, Nord Pass for your passwords, and it's all the app and the browser extension that are everywhere that are super easy to use and you'll get that huge discount on four months for free at nordvpn.com forward slash Bellular Gaming with the Bellular Gaming promo code. Big thanks to Nord for supporting the channel. With that said, let's get into the fun super weapons of the Warcraft setting. Kicking things off with a more manageable, more understandable super weapon, we have Gallywix's Pride, the goblin doom cannon of Bilgewater Harbor, a city that was rapidly constructed in a shower's bay of storms, both to rehome the goblins of Kazan and also to strengthen the Horde's military. Pretty handy having a big port and a cannon right beside Orgrimmar. But yes, it's not just a port, it also houses this cannon, this super weapon. Gallywix's pride is absolutely massive, and inside, a telescope points at Stormwind. So this is a terrifying weapon looming over the Alliance that could fire whenever the Horde wanted to, uh, you know, blow up the Alliance's greatest city. Sort of conjures up souped up imagery of the German Gustav railway gun or even the United States proposed 1,000 mile range strategic long range cannon. Neat naming, guys. The Germans actually even worked on a version of the Gustav that could hit uh, London from Cali. So pretty big. Going back to Azeroth, it's kind of the same thing, but fantasy universe stop. And I think we, well, we had every reason to expect that Gallywix's pride would be fired. The now ex-Blizzard employee, Alex Afrasabi, basically teased as much in 2018 at BlizzCon that that cannon would go off, so either plans have fallen through or it still may happen. Gallywix has been found. Yeah, Gallywix, he's in Tazavesh, just chilling, talking to some brokers. And if not that, then hey, we have some reasons to suspect the Turalian might be uh, a bit corruptible, a bit influenceable by the light. So what could a extremist light twisted alliance do? And what could they force the Horde to do in return? Well, turns out the Horde got a big cannon pointing at Stormwind should the alliance do something nasty. Next up, we've got the Naru Dimensional Ships, but specifically, we're going to go for the Vindicar, for it was purpose-built to wage war. During the Third Legion invasion, Kil Jaden invaded the Exodar, making Valen realize that he truly could not run anymore. And so the Draenei set about building their vengeance. And like with many ships, the Vindicar would undergo extensive refits, incorporating weapon systems from the Army of the Light's Xenadar, now it's at a stage where it can rapidly transport troops with its teleportation network. It can provide various means of fire support. It's a mighty ship that's even powered by the crown of the Triumvirate. And it's one that's firmly in the Alliance's control. So should that Urel expansion happen, and should Turalyon make some questionable moves? Well, Turalyon is a man of the Army of the Light. He has literally spent more time in the Army of the Light than he has on Azeroth with the Alliance. So who knows, he just happens to have a big spaceship full of guns. The Blight was a key component in the Lich King's bid to take over Azeroth, a super effective bioweapon that created fresh soldiers for its wielder. It was so effective that it destroyed the most powerful region on Azeroth, 
Lordaeron. I mean, it was a region that housed Kalthlas, extreme magic power, the Seven Human Kingdoms, uh, one of which was Dalaran, and of course, the Wildhammer Dwarves. Now that area is a bit of a wasteland. Now today, we're great at dealing with plague, but what if someone made it worse? Lethal to both the living and the dead. Well, of course, we know that's exactly what the Grand Apothecary Society had been working on since Vanilla. The Forsaken players actually helped in the earliest experimentations of that new plague. Of course, the events of Wrathgate saw its first use, a weapon so destructive, of course, that the Horde outlawed its research and its production. Not that that would stop Sylvanas, for she oversaw its refinement, so when it appeared in the Legion expansion, it melted skin from bone. It dissolved bone to slime. <laughs> when Sylvanas became war chief, all bets were off. Suddenly, forsaken plague marines were in the front line of every conflict. Sylvanas and Nathanos tipped their arrows with the stuff. Then, when Lordaeron City was conquered by the Alliance, their leadership was nearly drowned in New Plague, making the place, of course, unlivable for the foreseeable future in the process. Now, we never saw the full potential of the New Plague, but considering its legacy and its destructive force, I think we can put it at a pretty comfortable number eight on this list, especially since we must presume that caches of this stuff exist across Azeroth ready to be activated at any time, or perhaps ready to fall into the hands of those people that our factions cannot control. The Mana Bomb. It is Azeroth's nuke. Kalthas and his Blood Elves basically ran their own Manhattan Project in Netherstorm, with the first bombs destroying Cenarian Thicket and Kirinvar Village. Now, we don't know the exact physics of one of these things, but it seems the more mana you stuff into the bomb, the more destructive the bomb is. So it was especially bad news when Archmage Thalen Songweaver designed his own mana bomb sometime later, just that it was one that was empowered by the Blue Dragonflight's focusing Iris. Garros just ascended to Warchief, a title that he took very literally, almost immediately massing troops to fake an invasion, in the process drawing more Alliance forces into Theramore, only for him to mana bomb it. Theramore was flattened. Archmage Ronin died. Four top generals died. The nuke of the Warcraft universe. This is it. And it's one that the Horde could easily deploy with the Nightborn's telemancy. Now, you might think that's where mana bombs ended. No. Tactical mana bombs have actually been used extensively throughout Warcraft since Theramore, right up to our assault on Argus, where they were used. But with the focusing iris now locked away in Dalaran, anyone looking to wreak true havoc will have to perform quite the heist first. Next, a superweapon and a principle. This is a fantasy universe. It's one where planets are swimming in exotic power. And imagine for yourself, what would happen if some bad actors worked out how to just make Yellowstone National Park go boom? Well, there's no better example for us than Nordrasil, the first world tree. To end the War of the Ancients, the Well of Eternity had to be destroyed. Now, Illidan was furious at this happening. He took seven vials of its waters and he poured three into a quiet lake atop Mount Hyjal. And from this, a miniature well of eternity was born. This was bad. This sort of tooling around with magic is what led to the Legion invasion of Azeroth in the first place, and it was downright illegal. So, for this, Illidan got his 10,000 years in prison, but the cat was out of the bag. It couldn't be destroyed, so Alex Straza planted an acorn from Kahanir, the mother tree of the Emerald Dream, and planted it in the lake. And nourished by the lake's power, this tree flourished. It was blessed by the dragon aspects, gaining it even more strength. Nordrasil, as it came to be known by, was no super weapon, but contained within it was such power that, if harnessed, the destruction would be immense. And harnessed it was. Because as Archimonde came to claim its power, Malfurion knew that there was only one option. 
sacrificing the dragon's blessings, he blew that big horn of Cenarius, summoning in the thousands and thousands of wisps, which of course detonated, blasting the legion very much back to the twisting nether. Nordrasil was damaged, but it survived, which I think is a testament to the power that courses through the world, and proof that basically we all in Azeroth live atop a powder keg. Nordrasil is just one. What's going on with the ley lines at Karazhan? With various other places in the planet? There are so many different schemes that could lead to a lot of destruction. The Legion was specifically set up to wipe out all life in the cosmos. And as such, it is packed with world-ending weapons. So let's go up a bit of a bell curve of destruction to see what the Legion had. First up, Apocalypse, the Unholy Death Knight Artifact Weapon. This was originally created by the Nathrezim, and it was imbued with their natural ability to turn ally against ally. Much like with Kill Jaden's Lich King plot, it spread plague and famine, softening up an entire world for the Legion to come and just steamroll it. And of course, with our Shadowlands lore and thinking about plague and things, we have to wonder if there was a little bit more to what the Nathrezim did with it. Then, of course, there is Altalash, which itself is a, uh, well, it's got a Nathrezim soul trapped inside. Now, it absorbs the soul and the power of its wielder, and it's done so for so long that reportedly even Sargaris feared it a bit. Next, though, we've got the Garothi Worldbreaker. It was created within the heart of Argus, and while it was a very early boss in that raid, canonically, it was designed to decimate worlds. So it's a walking super weapon that just destroys worlds. Then, you've got what Sargaras does with the, well, those he corrupts. Argus provided him with an infinitely regenerating army, and in the very worst case when he fought Argus, seemingly the ability to end creation. Yet, these technically pale in comparison to the jeweled scepter of Sargaras because, well, it was meant, it was forged to ferry Sargaras' spirit between worlds. That's how it ended up in Azeroth. But the thing is that to achieve this, the scepter was woven into the fabric of reality itself. This scepter literally destabilized the universe. That's pretty wild. And in our next point, we're going to see a taste of what that can actually mean. We have another unintentional super weapon, but this time it's Ner'zhul reckoning with powers beyond his control and the damage that he did. I don't think he really knew what that scepter was capable of. When the Orcish Horde lost the Second War, a damaged Ner'zhul assumed control of things. Gorfiend hatched his plan, an insane plan, to open hundreds of dark portals all across the planet. And to do this, they sent agents to Azeroth in search of the Skull of Gul'dan, the Eye of Dalaran, the Book of Medivh, and the Jeweled Scepter of Sargaris. The ritual quickly flew out of Ner'zhul's control, and as he fled through a dark portal, the whole planet tore apart. Together, these magical items tore a entire planet to pieces. We literally see here how the scepter of Sargaris can tear reality apart. And while there are so many examples of magical rituals becoming super weapons and insane power locked within things, I think the destruction of Draenor makes the point pretty damn well, and it's number four in our list. All right, the Legion have had their turn. Now it's time to talk about what the Titans are actually capable of. We could, of course, begin with the Pillars of Creation. I mean, they've got their own crazy abilities. The Tidestone, just opening the ocean, crashing fleets. The Hammer of Kazgaroth, you could easily destroy a city in that. I mean, it shaped a valley. Chronicle tells us it can raise and sink mountains. So we better not let that get in the wrong hands. And while the Aegis of Agrimar and the Tear of Alun are very powerful, I think the Eye of Amonthul is perhaps a step above the others. Something so powerful that I think power hardly matters. I mean, it is a vessel of extreme arcane and temporal magic. And if you think about Amonthul being the very first Titan, and this being his object, I mean, Arcane, temporal magic? It certainly seems rather close to the sorts of mysterious powers that we saw Zoval use once he combined the sigils. 
We'll talk about that a little later. For really crazy Titan weapons and to show what their technology can do, you need only look at Nazoth. Algalon threatened us with reorigination, which is a process that would wipe Azeroth clean. Then in Cataclysm, we were taught that actually that's all part of the Titan's vast world building machinery, and BFA saw us wield it, along with the engine of Nalak Shah and the heart of Azeroth to zap Nazoth. This concentrated beam of a Titan's power that was enough to handily destroy an old god. Assuming that did actually happen. Although, it was probably a one-time thing. If we ever do need a super weapon, I would immediately look to Titan technology. And this segment is not just retreading old lore, because I think that's what Blizzard wants us to think. After all, why else would they have teased us the existence of Uldorus and Uldaz, two Azerothian Titan facilities that we know nothing about? We don't know much about this thing, but what we do know paints a stark picture. When Sir Garrus fell, the semi-sentient blade split itself in two, so that the Dark Titan couldn't use its full power. One half, of course, was claimed by Agrimar, and we saw a fell corrupted version of it in Antorus. The other half, Gorabal, is currently stuck in Silithus. Now before all of that, it was of course used to destroy an unnamed Titan world soul that was infested with Void. This is a weapon that can literally cleave a planet in two. It's also stated, and I think this is a clear tease for the future, that if a hero brings the two halves of the weapon together, they could reform it into Gorshalach. That's clearly a plot thread that Blizzard are going to pick up later. Regardless, Gorshalak is the most powerful, like, just big sword in the setting. So why the hell are we putting it number two in our list? Well, she may not be a super weapon, or even a weapon, but everyone's trying to use her as one. Have you ever wondered why Sir Garrus was so desperate to claim Azeroth? You know, to corrupt her for power? To destroy her? To deny Void its prize? Or, as the jeweled scepter of Sir Garrus told us, that he kind of had the hots for her? Well, we'll have to ask him, I suppose, later. But barring the Titan love angle, it's clearly because of her power. I mean, hell, Void's endgame is the creation of a Dark Titan, which is the corruption of Azeroth. The Titans thought of her as the final Titan, and they did so much to protect her. Every Force wants a slice of Azeroth, but right now, we don't know exactly why. The discovery of Azerite, I mean, even that, even a little drip of the Azeroth power, that uh, hastened a tremendously ruinous war. That was just a tiny bit of her power. We don't know what's going to happen when Azeroth will wake up, or if she'll wake up, or even if that's something Blizzard are going to do in the setting, but this whole cosmos is becoming bigger with each revelation, right? And we're just discovering how deep the water is, how large the shadows loom. It's no longer dragon flights or an order of paladins. No, it's big now. And I've lied to you. This is number one on the list but it's not the end of the list. Doing a video like this is honestly quite funny in the modern era of the lore. You know, it's, we talked about nukes and big cannons that can destroy cities from across oceans. I mean, across a continent or between two continents. And that's tiny because point zero on our list is the language of creation. The divine song that spewed forth everything that is. Because, um, yeah, all that we could actually talk about in this video completely pales in comparison to Zoval's current plan, uh, which is to access that which created the universe, it seems. You can't top that, and uh, really, this stuff is so beyond weaponry that while we've got to acknowledge it, it doesn't really belong here. That said, though, I think there's a reason why Zoval went to the Sepulchre of the First Ones first instead of going to Azeroth, which he said he would do. So it's pretty clear. We've just talked about Azeroth being super powerful. Obviously, and if maybe it's the final Titan and it's special, he needs whatever he finds in the Sepulchre of the First Ones, and he also needs Azeroth. So, while the language of creation and remaking the universe is technically number zero in our top 10 list, maybe it's kind of Azeroth as well, because she's key to it. So there you go. What do you think of our picks? 
I mean, man, Warcraft is so full of things will explode that it's uh, kind of hard to pick out things for a video like this. But uh, I was happy with our picks. That said, what do you think? Any fun, spooky little weapons that are a bit more uh, obscure in the lore that you'd uh, like to flag up? Well, let us know down in the comments. That's it for me. Have a great day. Hope you found this interesting. I'll see you next time. Thank you.